Folks, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed church. And uh, I was going to use an illustration at the end of the service, but it goes right along with this. And so I'm going to move it up just because God told me to, all right? And if you'll get in the habit of doing what God tells you to do, you'll be better off, all right? Most Fridays, I ride my motorcycle. Everybody that knows me well knows that. And this Friday, I rode like I always do. Uh, we went up to Jasper, Arkansas, uh, round trip 304 miles. Uh, went from Jasper uh, to Huntsville and come back down the pig trail. And folks, it was picturesque. This, I'm telling you, everything's green. We saw deer. We saw animals. We saw rivers. It was just unbelievable scene. And I will say this. I don't know how somebody looks at creation and says there's not a God. I just don't understand that. But we went and ate, which we always do, me and a buddy of mine. I hadn't rode with him in several years. He's from Alma, and uh, he is a hardcore rider. I spent most of my day chasing him, all right? He is hardcore, and I never have gone that far. That's the farthest I've ever gone, but uh, I passed his test. He said I did good at the end of the day, so I felt good about that. We stopped at Ozark Cafe up there, and folks, it's worth going up there in your car. It's better on a motorcycle, all right? You see more. But I'm just telling you, we stopped at the Ozark Cafe, and we stopped to eat like we always do. Normally, I get a hamburger and french fries, which, man, I love ham- I'm, I love hamburgers and french fries. But <laughs> I got an amen there. But they had a catfish special. And so we decided, hey, we're going to eat this catfish special. So we ate it, and it was good. It was really good. And uh, we visit and talk, and I go to pay the bill, and the lady looks at me, the waitress, and says, your bill's already paid. And I said, okay, I'm 150 miles from anywhere. I looked around, there, there were two rooms, and I didn't see anybody I knew. And she said, uh, a lady paid for it, and she also did the tip. You don't even have to tip your waitress, but I did anyway, okay. And she handed me this note. This lady wanted me to have this note. And here's what it says. Thank you for being a Christian. Light in the motorcycle community. Have a blessed day, Aaron. And I got to thinking, folks, we are Christians everywhere we go. When I say hardcore, David, who I went with, he looks like a biker. Okay, he had all the leather on. And if you look at him, you would probably be scared. All right? But he had a Christian vest on, a Christian motorcycle club that he is part of. I always wear uh, my bracelets. I wear my bracelets on the outside when I ride so that they can see. One says believe, one says faith and I always wear them, and we prayed before our meal. And so we influenced that, not knowing, I still don't know the lady. We, don't, we have no clue. But when you think about the goodness of God, folks, God is everywhere, and he is so good. It was what I called the, the cherry on a perfect day. All right? I'll eat a Sunday, but I want that cherry because I want to eat it first. All right? And folks, I'm telling you, God is so good. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts 23. Uh, We are going through the book of Acts, if you're a guest, a first-time guest. Today, I'd like to talk to you about God's divine protection. God's divine protection. Uh, We'll start reading here in just a minute in Acts 23, verse 11. Let me give you the outline. Number one, the presence of God. The presence of God. I am telling you the most important thing here today is the presence of God. I love the music. I love to preach. I'm glad we have air conditioning in the building. All right? But the most important thing in worship is the presence of God. Number two, the deadly Jewish plot. The deadly Jewish plot. And again, folks, where God is Satan is also right around the corner. There are mean people, mean people in this world, and we have to deal with them. We have to deal with them. And number three, the ambush spoiled by God. The ambush spoiled by God. What a man means for evil, God means for good. And here's the deal, folks. The sovereignty of God will win out every time. God is in control. You may think someone else is in control, but God is in control of every situation in your life. 
You know, our scripture text finds Paul in an extremely difficult circumstance. He has just been falsely accused, nearly torn apart, arrested, imprisoned, and threatened. Earlier, Paul and Silas, if you remember earlier in Acts, they were delivered from jail with an earthquake. What we must understand that God doesn't always use miracles as a, men, uh, as a means of deliverance. Sometimes it is by, God, by his providential control over circumstances that saves the day. Just ordinary circumstances God shows up in. This story in the life of Paul contains uh, very little doctrinal truth, but it does let us know that God is watching over us 24-7, 365 days of the year. Once again, God comes through in spite of a conspiracy filled with lies, hate, and deadly anger. Let's look at God and Jesus encouraging Paul and letting him know that everything is going to be all right. And as we left last week, the two, the two factions, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, all right, they were, they were at odds, and the Pharisees were saying, let him go, he has done nothing wrong. And the Sadducees were extremely upset by what was going on. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11. But the following night, the Lord stood by him. Folks, I am telling you, if everyone abandons you, God will stand by you. If you are single, let me tell you this. You are never alone. God is always with you. He has the Holy Spirit inside you. He has Jesus walking with you. And it, he says, look at this. And the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. Now we know through Scripture and studying through the book of Acts so far, there's been three times that Jesus himself has spoken to Paul. I wished I had that privilege. God speaks to me all the time, but I've never heard an audible voice. Never have. But three times already in Scripture, you'll see the red writing in your uh, New Testament, all right? Jesus himself comes. It started at his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. He came to him. He also came to him in Jerusalem. And, and he told him, leave Jerusalem when he first got saved. When he started preaching, there were Jewish folks after him. And they have been after him ever since he was saved. And the third time was in Corinth where he was ready to go and leave, but yet the Holy Spirit, Jesus, came to him and said, no, you stay this time. So again, we have the Holy Spirit, and I know when to pick up and leave. I know when to stay. I know because we try our best to listen to the Holy Spirit. So here's the fourth time. Three things I want you to see in this. Number one, be of good cheer, Paul. What is he saying? Paul, don't be afraid. Be courageous. Be courageous. It looks bad. It looks like you're going to die. It looks like, you know, they're going to they're gonna get their wish. But the first thing he says is, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem. The th second thing, the first words of Jesus are words of courage. The second one is words of commendation. What is Jesus saying? Paul, you've done good. You've done good. I know, uh, you know, there's not a lot of converts. I know you're getting uh, hammered. You're getting persecuted. People are telling you to be quiet. People are hating you because of your message. But you're doing what I've asked you to do. So he gives him words of courage. He gives him words of accommodation. And the last thing he gives him is words of confidence. Confidence. Look what he says. So you must also bear witness at Rome. He's saying, I got this. I've got this. I am in control of this situation. It's not people. It's not people. God is in control. And for the last year of his life, as he was coming to the end of his third missionary journey, he got to thinking, man, I'd like to go to Rome. I'd like to go to Rome. I'd like to go to Rome. And what has God said? God confirmed it in his life to give him confidence that this is not the end. This is the beginning of your journey to Rome. 
Folks, I am telling you, if you will follow God, the Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. So seeing here the presence of God, folks, we know when the presence of God is near us. We know when God talks to us as Christians, when God is speaking to us. But on these special occasions, for people like Paul, and and not everybody gets this. Matter of fact, very few people get this. And it wasn't a dream, folks. It was Jesus himself telling him everything is going to be all right. Oh, folks, there's nothing like prayer. Prayer. Communion with God. Praying to God. And when you get up from a situation or, or a circumstance that you have the peace of God in your life. So we see the presence of God in Paul's life. The second thing I want you to see, not only the presence of God, oh, wait a minute, I forgot my scripture. Mark 4, go with me. (laughs) I just forgot my subscripture. Mark chapter 4, go with me. This is the presence of Jesus. Mark chapter 4 with the disciples. With the disciples, look at Mark 4, 35. On that same day, when evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, let us cross over to the other side. That's Jesus' words. And folks, when his disciples were with him, it was a teaching situation, always. He was teaching them, teaching them something. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took, uh, took him, Jesus, along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. So it would have been several of the disciples. And a great windstorm arose, and waves beat the boat so that it was already filling. All right? Now, folks, if you've ever been on a lake when a storm comes up and you're in a boat, that's not a good thing. All right? I've been there. I've done that. And I've had to where we had to race to shore. All right? But he was in the stern on a, uh, uh, in the stern asleep on a pillow. Man, I wish we could do that in our own lives. Man, when, in the, when we're in storms of life, we just sleep like a baby. You say, well, he's Jesus. Well, folks, we got Jesus. He's on our side. All right, we have the Holy Spirit. Nothing bothers God. Nothing shakes God. He knows everything that's going on in our lives. And they awoke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, folks, that is a dumb question. You're asking Jesus whether he cared? That's how much fear was in these guys. And you have to remember, fear comes from Satan, folks. It comes from Satan. False evidence appearing real. Fear. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Folks, I'm telling you, Jesus had this, all right? He had it. He had it. It didn't surprise him. He had that kind of power. He was the Son of God. Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Oh, folks, I understand there's storms in life, but there are calm periods in our lives also that God allows us to have. And I got news for you, folks. If I'm in a storm and I'm in a boat, I want Jesus with me. I want him with me. But so many times, folks, we leave him out. We don't talk to him enough. We don't read our Bibles. We don't pray. He is in your boat. He is ready to help you. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No faith. How many times has he told his disciples in the Gospels, you have to have faith. God is in control. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Folks, that's my God. That's my Jesus. There is no storm in life that you should be afraid of. None. Why? Because Jesus is with us all the time. So we see the presence of God. The second thing I want you to see is the deadly Jewish 
plot. Look at this in verse 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. See, they wanted Paul. That's why they had this uh, just preliminary hearing that we would might say. Okay? And the commander stepped in and he took, took Paul and his soldiers and, and literally had to carry him away from that mob scene that was in the temple courts, the common court. And so they were upset that Paul got away. And I'm sure it was part of the Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They did not believe in spirits or angels. And so they felt like, man, we had him. We had him here. We can shut this guy up once and for all. But God took a Roman commander and Roman soldiers to save Paul's life. Now look at verse 13. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. And folks, people like this, they're what, what they called back in those days zealots. Okay? All right? They, they did things for a cause, and they always thought their cause was right. But I got news for you, folks. Ambushing someone and killing them is not okay. It's not okay. In 40 of them, and why 40? Because they knew he would be guarded. He would be guarded, and Paul would be protected. And what they did many times in places like this, they would wear these long cloaks, and they would get daggers or knives, and they would hide them under there. And then they would ambush people. Forty people made this oath. And I'll tell you how serious the oath was. It was as if they were saying, if we don't keep this oath, may what we want for this person happen to us. Folks, there's some sincere people in this world, but they are sincerely wrong. It is wrong to take someone's life. It is wrong to do what they are planning. So it says, verse 14, they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will, uh, we will eat nothing till we have killed Paul. Even on the fasting thing, they make it sound like it's almost spiritual. But folks, when hate enters, you know it's not from God. When hate comes, when you, when you break a commandment, the commandment is thou shalt not kill. They had no right to be doing this. Even the persecution was wrong. And Paul had been through it before. He really had. But this is getting extremely serious. It's extremist is what it is. All right? Un, under the, the sign of good, they were doing evil. Verse 15, Now you therefore, together with the council... All right, uh, and, and they got the high priest in on it. They got the Sanhedrin in on it. Okay, this this scheme, this plot, and it says, uh, therefore, get together with the council. Suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further in, inquir inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So what were they going to do? They were going to stand outside the garrison where the soldiers stay. They were going to wait for him, wait for them to bring Paul out, and they were going to kill him on the spot. Oh, folks, I think one thing that we don't understand is that we have Christians in third world countries that are persecuted every day of their lives. Their lives are on the line. They can't carry a Bible in public for fear of losing their lives. They don't have church like we have church here. They have underground churches or they meet in homes and, and they are persecuted and even many missionaries lose their lives. Folks, it is real. It is real every day in third world countries. So we see, and, and folks, you have to realize this is Satan's plan, okay? They did not get what they want, so they took matters into their own hands. Into their own hands. And what they were doing was wrong. But you know what Satan really wanted? Satan wanted to shut Paul up. They did. Satan and his demons wanted to just shut him up. 
And folks, I'm telling you, again, I don't, I'm not saying, I don't know the details of the coronavirus, but I know Satan was in it because he was trying to shut churches down. And folks, God prevails. God wins. And God was protecting the preacher, the evangelist, the church planner, the disciple, or Paul, because he wasn't finished with him yet. Turn with me to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. We're going to be looking at uh, some psalm today. They just speak to your heart. Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, O God, for a man would swallow me up. Folks, Satan will use anybody to get to you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to put situations in your life where you doubt God. He'll do things on Sunday morning to keep you from going to church. He'll do it. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Folks, we're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. Every day there is spiritual warfare going on in our lives. And Satan will use anybody. He'll use family against you. He'll use friends. Sometimes it's even our best friend that turns on us. He will use anybody. It can be a neighbor. It can be somebody you work with. Verse 3, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. Why do we need to praise his word? Because there are promises in God's word. You know what one of those promises are? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Folks, God's with us. I don't care how bad things get. God is with us. In God, I have put my trust. Folks, I'm hitting the age uh, where, you know, Social Security and, you know, all these benefits, you know, and, and again, I'm not going to collect it yet or, or anything like that. And people always worry about it. You know, well, when I get to Social Security, it's going to be broke. I got news for you, folks. The government doesn't pay my bills. God pays my bills. God takes care of me. I'm not going to lay in bed worrying about it. I refuse to do that. Satan throws you off by that. I will not fear. I have put my trust in God. What can flesh do to me? What can man do? Folks, I am telling you, you should not be afraid of anyone. Anyone. Anybody. I mean, the worst that could happen is somebody uh, could try to take your life or even take your life. But think about this, folks. You will be in heaven. I want to live. I really do. Every, and everybody wants to go to heaven, but I got news for you as a Christian. You got to die to get there, all right? So don't threaten me with heaven, all right? Don't do it. Five, all day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Folks, you may be the only Christian in your family. You may be the only Christian in your office. You may be the only Christian at school, uh, students. But I'm telling you, God will protect you. God will protect you. Shall they escape by iniquity and cast anger down the peoples, oh God? Now look at this. You number my wanderings and put my tears in your bottle. Folks, God knows every tear that has fallen from your face. God knows. He cares. He loves you. He's on your side. He is for you. He is with you. He is. If He puts tears in a bottle, are they not in your book? God has recorded your life. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're thinking. He knows how you feel. He knows the fear that you have. And never fear, because God's always near. Verse 9, when I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. In God, he says it again, the very same scripture. I will praise his word. 
in the Lord. I will praise His Word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Folks, do not be afraid of man. Do not be afraid of man. God is most powerful. So we see the presence of God. We see the deadly Jewish plot. Folks, it was serious. They were going to kill him. They wanted to kill him. They hated him. Hated him. And if they were given the opportunity, they would have taken Paul's life. So the third thing we want to see is the ambush spoiled by God. Folks, the bottom line is, if God is on your side, you'll win. If God's on your side, you'll win. Look at verse 16. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Very little is known about Paul's family. There was a lot of indications uh, that, that they just thought Paul had gone crazy, that, it, that he had lost it. And then later on, I think uh, they'd heard about his life. Some even believe uh, they came to a saving knowledge of Christ. But, but they're just not much at all in scripture and historically that is probably what happened all right so her his sister heard of the plot all right now i was trying to put two and two together in that you have to realize paul was a scribe excuse me was a pharisee and so some of these folks that were still there on the sanhedrin he probably knew and so word got back and it's like you can't keep a secret. They're, folks, they're just some folks. You say, don't tell anybody. Duh. I, <laughs> folks, I'm just telling you. Today, I, I mean, people, people know what I have for lunch with my son. Why? Because he posted it on Facebook. <laughs> I'm like, why are you doing that? Nobody cares what I eat. All right? There's nothing. Everything's public knowledge now. You can find dirt and you can find facts. You can find all kinds of things on everybody. But somehow Paul's sister found out and not sending an adult, all right, sending an adult would have been too obvious. Sending Paul's sister would have been too obvious. So she thought, I'm going to send my young son. It says, verse 17, then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. Notice also Paul didn't go. All right, why? Because it would have raised suspicion. It would have raised suspicion. And again, folks, I think Paul was just doing what God told him to do. If you are in tune with God, I am telling you, you'll do the right thing. You'll do it. Verse 18, so he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called uh, me to him and asked me to bring this young man to, to you. He has something to say. Then verse 19, and the commander took him by the hand. This is why I'm telling you, folks, I'm not even sure he was a teenager. I think he was somewhere between 10 and maybe 14 years old. Okay? I, I really do. He was a young man. Why else would he take him? If he was a man, he wouldn't have took him by the hand. All right? Just read the Scripture. And I think he got him off to the side. And at my guess, by this time, the young man had that look in his eyes like, oh, what am I doing? Where are all these people? Why am I in a garrison? Where are all these soldiers? What are all the... He was just asking himself. So he pulls this young man back to the side, and he gets him alone. And it says, and he went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said... The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. Verse 21, but do not yield to them. For more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves in an oath that they will neither neither eat nor drink until they have killed him. Now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. It was kind of like... Elijah, and Elijah was in the Old Testament was getting the, the, the strategic plan, all right, of where the Philistines were. And he was telling them. He would just tell them before they even got there. 
He was telling them what happened. Hey, folks, I got news for you. God knows everything about everybody. He knows everything. He's God. I've never understood how we can all pray at the same time and he hear, hears everybody's prayer. I've never understood that. But, folks, it's true. He's God. Okay, he's not human. You cannot put human flesh on our God. It's Jehovah, God of the Bible. And so he just tells them. Okay, he, he told Paul's sister, let me tell you what's going on. This is what's going on. He used somebody else to tell the sister, and they were just passing it along. Why? Because God made a promise to Paul. Paul promised him he was going to Rome. So he fulfilled that problem. Pro, uh, that promise. And folks, the ambush was spoiled. So look at verse 22. So the commander let the young men depart and commanded him that tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. Why? Because if word got around, what have they done? They'd have done it that night, folks. They would have probably got more than 40 people and tried to take Paul's life. Oh, listen to me, folks. God is in control of all situations. And I love this verse. With God, nothing is impossible. I don't care what situation you're in. Because, folks, there are people hurting. It may be a health situation. A health situation. The doctor has told you, hey, you may not make it. But i got news for you, folks. It's not over till God says it's over. Folks, I'm listening to God, and I, I go to the doctor. I do pretty much what my doctor says, except diet and exercise. That's, that's the only two I don't do real good on. And I'm joking. But I'm simply saying it's not over till God says it's over. God can do anything. Folks, he raised the dead. He raised the dead. And there's no situation in our life. A couple of more Psalms and we're through. Psalm 37. Go with me to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. What does that mean? Hey, you're in the Lord's army. You need to show up for work every day. Every day you need to wake up saying, God, I'm here, man. Tell me what my agenda is today. Tell me what my job is today. If you'll do that, I'm telling you, you'll be in step with God. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord holds him with his hand. Folks, if there's anybody I want holding my hand in bad times, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I understand we got Christian friends, and I thank God that he is the God of comfort. The God of comfort. But the Lord holds our hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. He is ever merciful and lends. His descendants are blessed. We've talked about that. We are blessed of God. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice. The truth will come out. Justice will prevail. God will win. There are even times in court of laws. We know of people that have not committed these crimes. Read the other day, some guy had been in prison 37 years years and he did not kill that person he always said he did not kill, kill that person new dna evidence come up and after 37 years he walked out a free man folks there's always somebody worse off than you are always for the lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints they are preserved forever but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Oh, folks, this earth is going to pass away. It's going to pass away. And I am telling you, we are going, I mean, even if something happens here on earth, we are going to be with Jesus and God forever and ever. Psalm 34, just turn back. 
to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The, faith of the, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. He delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Oh, folks, there's times I look at the news, or I look at this world, or I look at situation, and my heart breaks for people. My heart breaks. Folks, I am telling you, sin breaks the heart of God. But yet He still loves the sinner. He still helps the Christian. He still helps the underdog. The underdog. I am telling you, if it's just you, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, I'll take those three on my side versus as many as you want to put against us and save such as have a contrite spirit. Folks, I'm telling you, we've just got to go to the Lord. We've got to be humble. We've got to realize we can't fix everything. We can't change everything. There are situations in life we can't change. Folks, if I had my way, and I've prayed, I've prayed somebody find a way to get rid of cancer. I just wish somebody... My mom died of cancer. I have overcome cancer, and I hate it, but I'm just telling you, I'm still trusting in the Lord. I'm still depending on the Lord. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards his, all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the souls of his servant, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Folks, I don't know about you, but my hope is in Jesus. My hope is in God, and he's going to see me through any situation of life. And folks, if you're here today, and you don't know the Lord, and I heard this said this past week. In death, I heard this said, I don't know how those who don't have the Lord get through death. Oh, folks, we've got God with us. We've got God with us. Father, thank you for the day. and God, I thank you for Scripture. God, your Scripture is right. It is yes, it is Amen. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray they would come forward and I pray they would make a profession of faith, that they would ask for forgiveness of their sins, that they would invite you into their lives, that they would acknowledge you as the Son of God and Jesus, our Savior. And God, I pray, and the Word says that you will save them. So God, I pray, this is the greatest need a person has in life. The greatest need is salvation. And God, I pray for the Christian that is just kind of down right now. God, they've been either persecuted or they're going through hard times. It could be physical. It could be emotional. It could be a family problem. God, it could be finances, finances. And God, I pray that they would just continue to trust you. God, you're going to see them through those storms in lives. So God, I pray that you would just let them know that you're near to them. Let them know that there is a solution to every problem. Let them know that the Word of God makes these promises and God will come through. God, encourage them in the faith. God, put a little zip back in their step and that smile back on their face. And God, I pray you take that fear from them. That fear, take it away, God. Give them that peace and joy in their lives. So God, if there's others that need to follow you in baptism or rededicate their life or even come for church membership, God, I pray you would speak to them now. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. This is your time. So God, we give it to you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for examples like Paul. 
They would have killed him on the spot. But God, you protected him. For he wasn't through yet. He still had a mission. You left him here on earth for a divine purpose. And the same is true for us. God, thank you for those promises. For they are faithful and they are true. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?